All right, I think we're going to get started. Welcome, everyone, to this event. My name is Jeremy Smith. I'm the Daniel Ellsberg Archivist, which uh, I'll talk a little bit about what exactly that is. Uh, this event is co-sponsored by the History Department and the Libraries, part of Homecoming. And uh, so I'm from, like I said, the Archives, Special Collections and University Archives, which is up on the 25th floor. As you can imagine, we have lots of material on the history of the university, as well as what we call special collections on New England history, innovation, and entrepreneurship. Uh, however, the dominant theme of many of our collections is social change, which was informed by our acquisition of the W.E.B. Du Bois papers in the 70s, and hundreds of other collections that we have on a range of social change-related topics. In 2019, we acquired the papers of Dan Ellsberg, Primarily thanks to the advocacy and initiative of three individuals, Bob Pollan, who's a co-director of the Political Econo e Economy Research Institute, and he's an econ professor here, Chancellor Subaswamy, and our late director of SCUA, Rob Cox, who, for those of you who knew him, was incredibly charming and skillful at impressing donors with his vision for having their papers deposited at UMass. So I think the combination of those three people really helped get the papers here. And you know, a lot of the other amazing collections that we have are really primarily thanks to Rob. And we, in 2021, I believe, we renamed the archives after Rob. So we're now known as the Rob S. Cox Special Collections University Archives Research Center. So that's sort of a tribute to a lot of Rob's amazing efforts. And Rob met Dan and Patricia, I, I was one of the people who went out before we got the papers to survey them and figure out how we were going to get them here. And, uh, you know, I think Rob spent, you know, total in total maybe about a week with them. And a after he passed, they, Dan and Patricia were incredibly uh, moved. Uh, and they only met him a few times, um, but they acted when he passed as if he, they had known him for, for years. And so I think that really speaks to the effect that Rob has had on a lot of the people he knew. So people are indicating that they back here. Okay. That's because the mic's not on. <laughs> so um, over here, you've probably seen, we have the Ellsberg exhibit, which came together in the winter of 2021. And it was assembled by students who were part of an Ellsberg-related class that uh, Chris is going to talk about. And it really, it also helped assemble a website about Ellsberg called the Ellsberg Archive Project. And that contains selected documents from the collection, as well as recordings from a spring 2021 Ellsberg conference that we had that was virtual. Uh, and a time, it has a timeline on Ellsberg's life. So there's lots of more detailed information even outside of the exhibit. Uh, it's the web address is umass.edu slash Ellsberg. Uh, there's also more documents from all, the, all these cases here. Uh, most, if not all, of these documents have been digitized. Some of them are, you know, many pages, so we couldn't, you can't really read them all, but they're all digitized, so you can go on that website and read them all in depth. And it should be up through the end of the year, uh, maybe into the spring, this exhibit. And there's, if anyone's interested, there's another part to this exhibit that's up on the 25th floor. After the event, if anyone really wants to see it, I'd be happy to lead a, uh, a crew up there to, to go see it. And that's mostly uh, Dan's early life uh, up there. So we're all here to see uh, Chris Appy. Chris Appy, uh, received his uh, BA at Amherst College and his PhD at Harvard. He's recognized as an authority on the history of the Cold War, US foreign policy, nuclear weapons, and the Vietnam War, a topic he teaches in a popular UMass history course called The American War in Vietnam, which I believe he's teaching this semester. He's written three books on Vietnam, including Working Class War, American Combat Soldiers in Vietnam, in which he explores the experiences of American combat soldiers. In another book, Patriots, the Vietnam War Remembered from All Sides, he assembled oral histories 
of Vietnamese and American combatants, policymakers, anti-war activists, journalists, and others. And in his most recent book, American Reckoning, the Vietnam War and Our National Identity, he writes about the history of the war and its impact on American national identity, culture, and foreign policy from the 50s through the Obama administration. Uh, he received a Chancellor's Medal in 2017 and delivered a lecture on the atomic origins of America's national security state. And he's currently working on a book, which I think the seeds of what you'll hear today are going to go into about Dan Ellsberg, based largely on Dan's papers. Uh, Chris comes into the archives almost weekly to pour through the 500 plus boxes that we have uh, doing research for that book. And as I said, we acquired those in 2019. So I, I think the, the working title is the same as the, the title of this lecture as well. And during the pandemic, he taught a class in which he's going to talk a little bit about called Truth, Dissent, and the Life of Dan Ellsberg, in which students utilized the archives and spoke with historical actors in Dan's life and, and outside of his life via Zoom. And this was a and a lot of these people grappled with a lot of the issues that uh, Ellsberg himself has throughout his career. And it was really kind of a historic, I participated in the class, this was one of the only, it was the only history class that was allowed to be in person during the pandemic. So this was fall 2020. Uh, and because the students needed to get access to the archive for the class. And I went to every class I was there, I was kind of the embedded archivist because I needed to, the collection is, being processed now, so I needed to help the students. And it was a real historic, one of the students is here today. Uh, it was a real his, sort of a, I felt like we all kind of went through something together, because if you think about that time, besides the pandemic, the election was happening, January 6th happened, and uh, every week we were talking about something that Ellsberg dealt with, and it seemed like it was happening again, right in front of our eyes. So it, it was really, uh, impactful class for I think everyone involved. So with that, I'm gonna introduce Chris and take it away. Thanks so much, Jeremy, and thanks for all of you for coming out. I'd like to say that I had something to do with the acquisition of Daniel Ellsberg's papers at UMass, but I had absolutely nothing to do with it. But I'm inc incredibly grateful uh, to Rob Cox and the Chancellor and, and Rob Paulin uh, for convincing him to make this the repository for his treasure trove of 500 boxes of material. The guy's a borderline hoarder, thank God. An archivist's dream saved everything. Or nightmare. <laughs> or nightmare. Um, but um, his, the, the arrival, I think one of the main reasons that he chose UMass was that he was very impressed by the tradition of collecting uh, papers around issues of, um, of social change and peace activism and social justice. And um, so it was a great coup for the university to get them and it obviously inspired a host of projects. And my absolute immediate thought was maybe I will write a biography. I've never done a biography, but this would be an interesting guy to write about. And, his twin obsessions, nuclear weapons and, and Vietnam, the Vietnam War, were really increasingly my two main interests. So it seemed to be, you know, a uh, no-brainer. Uh, it also inspired a collaboration with uh, a UMass alum named Charlie Sennett, class of 84, I think, a, a history major who runs a project called the Ground Truth Project. And he was interested in doing a series of podcasts um, which you could easily find at the Ground Truth Project site. Uh, um, and uh, so he, um, he, our class collaborated with him on that. They, they recorded every uh, class. Uh, and um, we also decided that would be a great idea to, to build a, a website called the, the Ellsberg Archive Project, which I encourage you to go take a look at. And then finally, as Jeremy mentioned, this two-day online international conference, which so one, of, one of the silver linings of the pandemic is that if we'd had a regular conference, we might have been able to, you know, bring four, five, six people to campus, put them up, pay for them, take them out to eat, and all the expenses that go along with that. But 
since it, we had to do it virtually, you could, you could pay people a very token amount to participate in front of their computer screen. So we had 26 very high uh, profile people participate in that conference. And, and I think more than 25,000 people have, have, have watched it, the recordings of it um, online. So as all of this was unfolding, it occurred to me that the university should try to, to build on the momentum of these projects and to create something um, more permanent. And so I had uh, the idea of proposing that we build an Ellsberg Institute uh, for Peace and Democracy. It sounded like a good idea. I floated it to my dean, who floated it to the chancellor. And before I know it, they're saying, great, do it. And then I was up to my neck. I didn't know what the hell I was doing. I still don't. How do you build an institute? A lot of work. And what I quickly learned is that the main thing is you've got to raise a hell of a lot of money. And until you do, you have to call yourself an initiative. So we're still an Ellsberg initiative, uh, a ways off from becoming an institute. But we certainly need help for it. And so this is the, my little short pitch. If you really are interested in it, I'd love to hear your suggests and, and advice. And if you want to uh, support it you know, uh, more directly with money, it's easy to find. You just Google Ellsberg initiative, and it's still the first thing that pops up. And there's a website there, and it shows you how you, how you can help. It. More than that, it's important to pass it on to others. I, you know, ideally, you know, we'd fund the whole thing with 10 or 15, 20, 30,000 individuals giving you know, 25 bucks and that kind of thing. But uh, you do need some people with deep pockets. And one of the things that encourages them to, to make those kinds of transformational gifts is seeing a wide, broad, a deep interest in it. So I do want to say a few more words uh, added to, to Jeremy's about the, the class, uh, which was extraordinary. I, I had the same feelings Jeremy did. And it was co-taught in the spring by journalism pr professor Kathy Ford. Um, this was a great and very committed group of students who were willing to meet face-to-face -face during the pandemic. And as Jeremy indicated, it was really a year of, uh, a year of crisis. In many ways, one of the most uh, eventful years since 1968. Uh, I mean, there was, of course, the uh, onset of the pandemic. Uh, by the time the course started, 175 Americans had lost their lives. We're now up to 1.1 million. Uh, it initiated an economic crisis. You may remember that at the beginning of which people were really thinking this, this, might, this might lead to something on the, uh, equivalent to the Great Depression. But it also inspired an unprecedented uh, government economic intervention. Uh, that did avert the worst of that uh, economic crisis. But then, of course, we had the election, an election which we didn't know the results of until the Saturday after the Tuesday. And then the loser in that election uh, uh, never conceded and, and of course, uh, uh, d continues to claim that that election uh, was stolen. All of that culminating a, a few months later in the insurrection of January 6, 1921, right in the middle of the class followed by not, not the second uh, impeachment trial of the former president. So in many ways, this was uh, a difficult context, but one that really did allow students to engage with, with uh, the period of the 1960s and 70s, which, of course, uh, had its own extraordinary conflicts. I even left out one of the major events that preceded our class, which was the the, uh, the, the rise, unexpected to me and many others, of the Black Lives Matter movement in the wake of George Floyd's movement. So you had political crisis, racial cl uh, crisis, constitutional crisis. Uh, so too in the 60s, military, political, racial, constitutional crises that, that Ellsberg uh, was in the middle of. Uh, so um, I would uh, just want to say one more thing about that conference we had. The class of 15 students participated in that conference by, in effect, kind of showing what it was like to be in that class. And it was the first event. Uh, and it, if, you, if you, again, Google simply Ellsberg Conference Recordings, it'll pop up and it's the first one. And I really do. I think you'd be so inspired to listen to younger UMass uh, students, some of them now graduated, um, talking about their year's experience. I honestly got three or four emails from people in the wake of that who had seen it, who were so impressed by the students. 
they said, did you edit that? I mean, they were so articulate and so thoughtful. Uh, so ch check it out. It's really impressive. Now, Ellsberg, in, you know, in my mind, is the greatest anti-war whistleblower uh, in our history. But, you know, as, uh, as a biographer, I, I need to be aware of the fact that while he was once a household name uh, to many people, uh, for younger Americans, he's mostly an unknown figure. And even people my age and older, I've noticed, have a pretty sketchy uh, memory of what he was up to and, and, and need some reminders. So I am going to spend just, I hope, just a couple minutes to quickly uh, g give a very abbreviated and somewhat superficial uh, overview of, of his life and then try to um, go in a little bit more detail on some, some issues that I've been thinking quite a bit of, uh, about. So if, if in um, listening to this very super brief uh, sketch, you, you hear some details that you know, awaken curiosity or questions, I hope we'll have some time at the end for, for those and be happy to talk about any of them. Ellsberg was uh, born in 1931, uh, raised in Detroit to Jewish parents who interestingly became devout Christian scientists. Uh, Dan never shared that uh, faith, but it was a significant part of his childhood. His mother, a very forceful woman, was determined that Dan would be a concert pianist, her own personal great dream. And he was made to practice the piano at least four hours a day, starting at the age of five, more hours on the weekend. He did it in part because he was uh, increasingly proud of his progress, but also because he deeply wanted uh, to um, please his mother. And he kept at it um, for 10 years and got to be uh, quite extraordinary. Uh, gave it up mostly for many, many years, but, but sometime I think in the 80s, did, uh, his wife bought him a very nice piano and he did return to playing and does still play somewhat. Um, when he was 15, there was a terrible, terrible tragedy. Uh, his family drove by car from Detroit to Denver where both parents had family. And in Iowa, Dan's father fell asleep at the wheel. And the, the car swerved uh, into a sidewall over a culvert, and it sheared off the entire right side of the car where his mother and sister were sitting and killed them both. Uh, Dan was 15 at the time. He was sitting behind his father. And uh, they survived. Uh, Dan badly, badly broke his leg and was in a coma. And at, at the hospital, if his father had uh, had his way, he would not have been treated based on his faith. But his uh, uh, Jewish relatives, who quickly came from Denver, uh, overruled that decision. And, and he did receive uh, treatment then. Uh, Dan was very brilliant, by all accounts, always a, a brilliant the word genius is sometimes overused, uh, but uh, I, I don't have any qualms about talking about him. And also kind of a polymath, too, talented in many different fields. Uh, he got a full scholarship to a very fancy uh, private school uh, in Michigan, Cranbrook. And uh, that was followed by another full scholarship uh, to Harvard, where he graduated in 1952, summa cum laude uh, in economics. After a year of graduate study in England, he did a very unusual thing for that cohort of Harvard graduates. He decided to uh, enlist in the United States Marine Corps in the 1950s and served for three years. The Korean War was over, but did a lot of duty in the Mediterranean. He had already been offered probably the most prestigious, one of the most prestigious fellowships still in this country, a Harvard Fellowship, a three-year fellowship. He became a Harvard Fellow in the late 50s, and that's uh, the time in which he began first as a consultant and then as a full-time employee of um, already then but still a famous American think tank called the Rand Corporation in Santa Monica, California, primarily then funded almost entirely by the Air Force and other government contracts and, and working on lots of things, but again, primarily nuclear war strategy. And that was, in fact, what Dan was working on in the late 50s and early 60s. Uh, 
primarily on issues of command and control. Uh, I won't have time to go into any, any depth about that work, but it's an extraordinary and less known part of his life. So if you're interested, I could say a few things about that later. He was very much, a, in those days, a cold warrior, at least in foreign policy, though a liberal on domestic issues. He sort of saw himself as a Truman Democrat, but also greatly admired Presidents Kennedy uh, and Johnson. He did go briefly to Vietnam as early as 1951, but didn't start working full-time on the Vietnam War until he uh, took a, a job as an official in Robert McNamara's uh, Pentagon, the Department of Defense, in 1964, and stayed there uh, for a year before going to Vietnam for the State Department for two years in the mid-60s, um, working for um, Edward Lansdale on, on ways, trying to identify ways to uh, fight a war he believed in, but to fight it uh, in a more effective uh, way that might have some chance of achieving American objectives. After 20 months in Vietnam, he did return to Rand. Um, and at that time, this was 1967, he came back, had to come back whether he liked it or not really, he suffered some a serious bout of hepatitis. And when he returned, he learned quickly that uh, still Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara had his own increasing doubts about the war and had decided to commission a major study of, de of decision making uh, at the top levels uh, around that war going all the way back to the 1940s. He thought that that might uh, be of use to future policymakers and scholars to perhaps avoid some of the mistakes that they had made. Uh, Dan was uh, quickly asked to be one of the people to work on that study, uh, one of 35 actually, who produced this uh, enormous 7,000 page collection of uh, classified documents pertaining to uh, the Vietnam War, uh, but also several thousand pages of, of commentary by these analysts that, like Ellsberg, that were hired to put it, put it together. Uh, by this time, Ellsberg's views of the war were beginning to change, at first modestly, but then quite radically. Um, he was one of, the, uh, one of the first three people, and may still be one of the only three people, who have read and carefully read all 7,000 pages uh, of the Pentagon Papers. And it, it was indeed a mind-blowing experience for him. More about that later. Um, by September 1969, he was so opposed to the war that he, can, uh, he had decided that he, he, he was willing to risk his own career and even his own personal freedom if there was something he might do in some small way that might hasten the end of the war. Uh, that's when he decided to make uh, Xerox copies of the Pentagon Papers well, with the idea of uh, giving them to members of Congress in hopes that they would put them into the public record uh, and hold hearings on them, which they were fully capable of, of doing uh, without any legal uh, problem. Uh, but I, in fact, none of them did um, uh, have, in my view, the moral uh, or political uh, courage to, to do that, uh, though some expressed interest, uh, at least at the beginning, William Fulbright and George McGovern. Uh, with that, Ellsberg eventually found uh, an outlet for the papers through journalist uh, Neil Sheehan at the New York Times. And so uh, it's, it's then finally in June of 1971 uh, that the New York Times begins to publish excerpts of the Pentagon Papers. Uh, when that happened, uh, it at first did not uh, stir much uh, um, concern in the White House. In fact, uh, Nixon actually thought, well, uh, remind me again, uh, Alexander uh, Haig or Kissinger, th those papers actually stop in 1968, right? There's nothing in there about me, correct? And uh, he said, that's right. And he said, well, that could be a good thing, right? I mean, it just, it, it makes, uh, you know, Kennedy and Johnson look, look terrible. This is, you know, um, maybe, maybe this is good for us. Well, within 24 hours, Kissinger and others uh, said, no, look, uh, this leaker, whoever it is, and we have good reason already to think it's Dan Ellsberg, poses a very serious threat uh, 
Why? Because he may have papers that he hasn't yet revealed about, which you have already done secretly, like bombing Cambodia, or trying to sabotage the peace talks in 68, other things, and your plans to expand and prolong the war going forward. So Kissinger, Kissinger said, in fact, he's the most dangerous man in America and must be stopped at all cost. So within days, the White House was whipped into a frenzy of outrage and, 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 and true paranoia about the threat represented uh, by Daniel Ellsberg and the press. So their first step was to seek uh, a court injunction against the Times uh, and to prevent them from continuing to publish uh, excerpts from the Pentagon Papers, um, a, a prior restraining order. Uh, this was the uh, first time in US history that the federal government had ever sought a prior restraining order, a kind of stop the presses order uh, to prevent a, a news story uh, from being published. Um, well, Dan, at that point, was never operating entirely on his own, key point. He had a cir circle of people that uh, he had entrusted with the papers, copies of the papers, and they helped him distribute portions of them to other newspapers, a fact that's not often remembered. Though with the movie The Post, many people do realize that the, the Washington Post at least got some of them. That was the first one. And they, too, were uh, enjoined uh, by the courts on the, on the request of Attorney General John Mitchell. But then it went to the Boston Globe and then the uh, St. Louis Post-Dispatch. And eventually, 19 American newspapers published portions of the Pentagon Papers that had been distributed by Ellsberg. It was uh, perhaps the most extraordinary act of collective media defiance of a sitting president in our history, certainly one of them. Uh, quite, quite remarkable. Um, the, um, whether or not it was legal to have these injunctions went quickly to the Supreme Court, really within two and a half weeks. And the, the Supreme Court, uh, six to three, determined that the government had not demonstrated that the Pentagon Papers represented uh, a serious threat to national security and that the uh, First Amendment rights in that case should prevail. Uh, but the, the, the Washington, I'm sorry, the White House had uh, other steps to take. Uh, but that, once that had failed, they were, had already indicted Ellsberg and Tony Russo, a colleague of Ellsberg that had helped him copy some of the, the papers. Uh, and uh, they eventually uh, charged him with more than 12 uh, felony counts, uh, several of them under the uh, Espionage Act. And uh, Ellsberg faced possible 115 years in prison. That uh, brings us to another first in this history. That was the first time in US history that the Espionage Act of 1917 had been used to criminally charge uh, an American citizen for giving uh, classified material uh, to the public, not to a foreign agent or a foreign country. It was leaking to the public and to Congress. Yes, people had been slapped on the wrist or even lost their clearances or in some cases lost their job for leaking classified information. But, but uh, Washington is a sieve of, of uh, leaking from the, top, the president on down. Uh, maybe not at that level, but uh, it, had, it had rarely gone punished, at least criminally. Uh, but even that court case against uh, Ellsberg was not enough for Nixon. He had whipped himself up into such a froth that he, he wanted uh, Ellsberg destroyed. And it's at that moment where he, um, he establishes something initially called the Special Investigations Unit, operating out of the White House. Um, and because their first job was to go after um, a leaker named Dan Ellsberg, they were quickly dubbed the plumbers. After all, what do plumbers do? In part, they plug leaks. So that, that was their job. Uh, and um, uh, in addition, uh, so um, they basically um, be began a set of illegal uh, activities intended to uh, silence uh, Ellsberg. Really, I think it was to silence him, possibly to blackmail him, certainly to smear him. But, but, but really to, 
prevent the biggest fear that he might leak further documents damning to the Nixon White House. Uh, so they convinced the CIA to do a couple of psychological profiles of him. That's well outside the CIA charter to be profiling an American citizen, uh, the illegal wiretaps. But the most serious of these crimes was breaking into the offices of Daniel Ellsberg's psychiatrist to try to find damning information. Um, these burglars, um, headed by uh, former FBI and former CIA agents, uh, G. Gordon Liddy and E. Howard Hunt, bungled the operation and ended up finding nothing uh, for their efforts. These, by the way, were the same, this is the same group, the same plumbers who even more seriously bungled several attempts to break into Democratic National Headquarters at the Watergate uh, complex just uh, nine months later. So the, um, there were those illegal activities. The trial did finally happen in uh, 1973, and it went on for months. Uh, the case was just about to go to the jury when the judge uh, received the extraordinary news that evidence was um, coming out of the Watergate uh, investigations that uh, the White House had committed these crimes against Ellsberg. And that, of course, completely tainted the government's case against him. So the judge had really no choice but to dismiss the case with prejudice, meaning they could never be charged on, on it again. Uh, uh, he especially had to do it when it soon came to light that in the middle of the trial, Nixon had offered him the directorship of the FBI. Uh, anyway, uh, Ells Ellsberg, uh, Ellsberg uh, goes, goes free. Um, but the point here is that the crimes of Watergate really began with the crimes against Ellsberg and, and other anti-war activists. Uh, maybe a little bit more about that later. Um, certainly, Ellsberg at this point uh, could not go back to Rand, where he was persona non grata. Uh, might have gotten an academic job, but he really uh, basically has spent the rest of his life as both a kind of one man think tank, but uh, more than that, a kind of permanent uh, activist. Uh, he, he, uh, he's still active at 91, giving these speeches and, and uh, interviews, and, uh, and by the way, uh, has been arrested roughly 80 times in acts of nonviolent civil disobedience in opposition to American foreign policy and nuclear, nuclear policy. Uh, I think maybe as recently as a year or two ago, he was arrested. All right, so now uh, I do want to dive in a little deeper to a few questions that I've been thinking about. That was, felt, I felt myself restraining myself going through that history. There's so much more. <laughs> seems so brief. Um, but let's just, let's just begin by thinking a little bit about this word whistleblower, which seems to be the, the kind of the, the, the easiest one word way of referring to, to Ellsberg and lots of other uh, people. So I, I kind of have my doubts as to whether or not that, that really is the, the best way of understanding the life and legacy and the significance of Daniel Ellsberg. Um, Understanding that there are lots of ways of defining a whistleblower, but let's just think at the beginning of, of, of a kind of narrow way of thinking about a whistleblower, sort of a, a conservative view of it, which I, I think um, would be to think of a whistleblower as someone um, uh, who calls attention, of course, to wrongdoing and, and shines a light on it, but really with the idea of uh, restore, restoring law and order and the rules of the game. I mean, think of, uh, think of the whistleblower of a sporting event, uh, you know, an umpire or ref referee. Uh, they're, they're blowing the whistle to call out infractions or wrong, you know, penalties, misbehavior of one kind or another, but simply to preserve the rules uh, of the game. So I, I think there is a tendency in some of the stuff that I've read about Ellsberg and talking to people to think of him as someone who really was... Uh, Yes, he wanted to end the war, but mostly he really wanted to preserve the republic and the constitution by helping to end this unpopular war and bring down a bad uh, president. Uh, but I think that diminishes and great, greatly limits our understanding of what Ellsberg means and the uh, serious challenges he poses to us as uh, American 
citizens. I mean, he has been one of the, for 50 years, more than 50 years, one of the most tireless and penetrating critics of UN, US foreign policy and has sought quite radical changes in uh, the uh, conduct, not just the conduct, but the exercise of American power. Um, and to try to move it in what he would refer to as an anti-imperial direction, uh, to rein in the almost limitless power of the president to make war in the nuclear age, um, to make foreign policy vastly more transparent, uh, less secretive, and accountable to the public, uh, to radically scale back a, a US uh, foreign military basing and intervention, and to uh, challenge the long history and ongoing exercise of undemocratic, secret, and unaccountable global interventions. Um, so that's pretty abstract, and I could give specific examples and talk about that more, but the, the basic point is that it occurred to me that maybe a more accurate word uh, for Ellsberg is a mutineer as much as a whistleblower, a guy who committed an act of mutiny. Uh, maybe you want to call him a mutinous whistleblower if we want to have it both ways, but I, I'm happy enough with that. Uh, but I got this word from Ellsberg himself when I read an essay he wrote in 1971 in a book, uh, book of essays about anti-nuclear activism. You may remember the 19, early 80s was a period of great ferment on anti-nuclear issues, the nuclear freeze movement, and opposition to Reagan's strategic defense Star Wars plan. In any case, he called this essay, uh, entitled it, Call to Mutiny. And, and uh, he ends this essay by comparing uh, the uh, entire world in the nuclear age to a kind of cult that's been held hostage in a sort of suicide pack because of the ever-present the ever threat posed by nuclear weapons. He even compared it to, uh, he compared this world of ours to a Jonestown in Guyana, which many of you will remember, where 900 Americans, uh, as part of this uh, religious uh, congregation, had been lured by this charismatic uh, and dictatorial preacher named James Jones, uh, who uh, in Guyana had made uh, these 900 people actually practice or rehearse mass suicides uh, so that uh, they would be uh, willing and able to carry it out on a moment's notice when he came to the conclusion that the end times uh, had arrived. Well, the end, time, uh, end times did arrive for those people in Jonestown in 1978 when Jones ordered the entire community, including, of course, the children and babies fed by their parents, to drink uh, the cyanide-laced Kool-Aid. Uh, Ellsberg goes on, that, uh, believing that the ongoing presence of nuclear weapons makes hostages of us all engaged in a kind of suicide pact, like, yeah, like hostages, living at the mercy of someone who, with a single order, could kill us all. Uh, he ends the, with these lines. We all live in Guyana now, and there is no place to run. It's time to say what the parents at Jonestown waited too long to say. No, not our children. This is craziness. We won't be a part of it. It is mutiny time in Jonestown, the revolt of the hostages. So, uh, so I'm just simply saying that uh, Daniel Ellsberg is more than a one-time whistleblower trying to restore order, but a fervent advocate of nonviolent resistance in pursuit of peace, disarmament, and democracy, and that continued. Um, briefly, I can't just, just very briefly, just think about Martin Luther King, now a national hero with his own holiday. So too, in that example, we very much restrict and limit our memory of King to basically what he said in 1973, that I have a dream speech. That's what the students are given. They are not given his extraordinary anti-war speech of 1947, precisely one year before he was murdered at Riverside Church, uh, where he described the Vietnam War as a war against the poor and described the United States government as the greatest purveyor of violence in the world today. He said many other provocative things that uh, 
It's not just about Vietnam. He said, you know, there will be many, many, many more Vietnams until we address the giant triplets of racism, materialism. He was starting to use the word capitalism then, but he used materialism and uh, militarism. Um, so um, a few words, because I do want to leave time for questions. But you know, um, surely it, it would be fascinating to get a better sense of that conversion. Because uh, uh, Ellsberg's conversion from war planner to peace activist really, uh, and this is part of what attracts me to this subject, is one of the most dramatic conversion stories in, in, in US history. Uh, I, I would hasten to add that, of course, millions of Americans at the same time were changing their mind about the Vietnam War. And I don't want to just write about Ellsberg. I want to write about that larger context. So maybe you'll have questions about that. But, but Dan was exceptional, at least in a few ways. And I would say this. There has never been a government official with his level of access to power and classified information who has broken so radically with the nation's military policies and taken such a personal risk in, to change those policies. Uh, very occasionally, an official will resign in opposition to this or that policy, but they almost never do it in a way that will compromise their careers or future opportunities, uh, not, to not to mention risk their personal freedom or prison. Um, I mean, there are very few examples. I mean, Cy Vance, for example, Secretary of State, resigned over Carter's decision to launch a military effort to rescue the hostages in, in Iran. But they're, they're few and far between. OK, so a few words about the stages of Ellsberg's uh, uh, transformation. From uh, his college days on to about 1966, he, he really was a, could, could be called a fervent Cold Warrior. Uh, and as he, he entered more and more and deeply into Vietnam, he did think it was a just war. Uh, one little story that gives you a sense of the young Dan Ellsberg came when he was in the Marine Corps and he was posted in the Mediterranean, was in Italy at a restaurant on shore leave and looked across the room and saw none other than John Wayne. <laughs> he immediately ordered a bottle of champagne to be sent to the table of this revered hero of his. And uh, I, in the interview I first did for another book with Ellsberg back in 1990, he said to me, seeing John Wayne, that was not like meeting a celebrity. That was like meeting Moses. He recruited us all into the, military, into the Marine Corps. Uh, also, he had incredible faith in the presidency and the right responsibility of officials with high security clearances to make decisions on behalf of us. That, um, he, again, in the same old interview I did with him, he said, I had thought that serving the president was the highest calling, a knightly calling. Knightly meaning knight of the round tables, a knightly calling. So you can imagine overcoming that, that your, your entire life, that was your dream, and you were actually doing it. And then to decide that this is, that the change was not going to come from the president. The president was the problem. Uh, that was, uh, itself became a major change. Uh, his wife, Patricia, they celebrated their 52nd wedding anniversary in August. She, uh, uh, she said this about Dan in that period. Dan was so much a part of the government structure that he wore bureaucratic blinders. He filtered out his basic human reactions, which had become submerged in Cold War rhetoric and a lifetime of training to see things as statistics and calculated risks. So the Vietnam War then was for Dan a problem to be solved. Uh, so he goes to Vietnam uh, to work on a better way uh, to fight it. Uh, he soon decides, this is a very complicated process, that um, it's, it, it is unwinnable, that we are locked into an unwinnable stalemate. Uh, and by the time he returns to Vietnam, he thinks it's an unwinnable sta stalemate from which we need to find an exit, but at that time he was still thinking of a face-saving exit. Uh, and was still thinking of for top-down change, I gotta convince the president. If I can't convince, but he was starting already to th maybe think about convincing Congress. Maybe I can convince presidential candidates. He developed a relationship with Robert Kennedy and advised him on Vietnam, wrote some speeches for him. 
Um, but the changes continue, and even in 68, he's starting to meet younger activists, like a young Gandhian pacifist named Janaki uh, Natarjan, who introduced him to readings and ideas that were totally new to him. He began reading King, whose writings was, were also new to him in 68. Met Tom Hayden, meeting a whole different set of kinds of people. Um, so again, to make a long story short, uh, by August of 69, uh, Dan had concluded that the war was uh, not uh, just uh, unwinnable, but fundamentally unjust, immoral. Uh, a crime to be exposed and immediately stopped. A war of US aggression. Uh, it was then that he began to copy the Pentagon Papers. So there were, uh, what's behind that change? This, this is a key subject. There are two, to my mind, two major elements to it. One is an intellectual. Dan always was the premier analyst, an intellectual. Ideas matter to him still. So honestly, reading the Pentagon Papers was hugely important to his decision that this war had been fundamentally flawed and unjust from the beginning. Uh, going back to the 40s, he, he discovered in these secret documents that the United States had never been on the side of democracy and self-determination in Vietnam, but had always acted as a counter-revolutionary imperial power. Um, and began referring to himself as a professional counter-revolutionary. He saw from the Pentagon Papers that the U.S. had sabotaged uh, democratic and anti-colonial solutions in Vietnam, first by supporting the French reconquest of Indochina after World War II, and then uh, by blocking the elections of 1956 called for by the Geneva Accords of 1954. He also discovered that from the very beginning, American policymakers while telling the public that the war was going well and that we um, uh, were deeply pessimistic much of the time in private about the prospects for uh, achieving uh, the victory, uh, but prolonged and escalated the war in a way, not wanting to be seen as losers. So there were these intellectual bases, and then there were also these personal and moral factors based largely on the kind of people he met. And I'll just uh, give you one example. He, he met uh, in 1969 at a War Resisters League conference at Haverford College, a 24-year-old man named Randy Keeler, who still lives in this area, uh, who gave a speech at that conference t telling the reasons for why he was going to prison for resisting the draft one of 5,000 Americans who went to prison resisting the draft. And uh, for Ellsberg, it was a shattering experience. It was the first time he said, I had come face to face with Americans willing to go to prison for refusing, refusing to collaborate in an unjust war. Uh, so he went to, he, he, he became so emotional, he, he felt himself beginning to cry and he went to the men's room where he said he spent an hour sobbing convulsively, feeling like, we were eating our young, both by sending them to Vietnam and relying on them to try to end the war. So he turned the question on himself, what might I do if I were willing to take similar sacrifices? What if I were willing to jettison my career and go to prison? And, and, and that was a key moment in his, his decision to copy uh, the papers. I really want to leave a few minutes, so I'm just going to quickly say a couple things briefly. Uh, Ellsberg is exceptional, but part of this larger mutiny. You know, again, these thousands of war resistors. A half a million Americans deserted the military during that whole long period, facing very serious legal consequences of their own. And in 1971, a month before the Pentagon Papers came out, a poll indicated that 71% of Americans had concluded that the war was at least a mistake. And an amazing 58% said the war was immoral. So the country had really shifted in profound ways, even within, and maybe especially within the military. In that same year when Pentagon Papers were released, 1971, a colonel named Robert Heinel published in the Armed Forces Journal an analysis of the, of the current state of the military in Vietnam 
and concluded this. By every conceivable indicator, our army in Vietnam is in a state approaching collapse. With units avoiding or refusing combat, murdering their officers, drug-ridden and dispirited, where not near mutinous, or one might say outright mutinous. So um, this, this, uh, this was the, the historical context in which uh, Ellsberg was taking uh, his extraordinary risks. And uh, the, uh, the overreaction, it must be said in conclusion, that the over massive overreaction of the Nixon White House made the Pentagon Papers and Ellsberg himself a central story for more than two years. It raises this kind of great what if question. What if they had just ignored it? What if they had decided not to form that plumber's unit? Would Watergate even have happened? Maybe so, but one point worth realizing, Nixon's fingerprints were all over the attacks on Ellsberg and other anti-war activists. Still to this day, we do not have concrete evidence that Nixon ordered the break-in at the Watergate. So had it just been the Watergate, see the, my point about Watergate, it wasn't just about, it wasn't Watergate, it was the roots were in the effort to silence the anti-war movement. It's because of the anti-war movement that, uh, and Nixon's overreaction to it, that his presidency came tumbling down and made the end of the war uh, absolutely certain because Ellsberg is actually convinced that if Nixon's political stature had held, he might very well have re-entered the Vietnam War after the Paris Peace Accords of 1973 to not reintroduce ground troops, but to reinitiate American bombing. But because of Watergate, he was so discredited politically, Con Congress was able to effectively to vote a clear no more military aid in any place in Southeast Asia. So I'll, I'll stop there. Went on longer than I wanted to, but I, I do hope that you know, you'll stick around for a couple minutes and just make a few comments or uh, any, any kind of questions. Yeah, When I think about Ellsberg and how he is revered today, and I compare him to Edward Snowden or Julian Assange or Chelsea Manning, who don't enjoy that same popularity and may have attain it, do you think that's actually true? And if so, what accounts for it? And what's the last part? If so, what accounts for it? Yeah, huge question. I can't really do justice to it, but I, I will say that um, yes. Ellsberg now is often used to uh, contrast favorably to these more current whistleblowers. And one of the more common ways to do it is to say, well, Ellsberg faced the music. He stayed. He was tried. He was willing to go to prison. Snowden has gone off and is, you know, uh, living in Russia. Um, I, I can't give a full answer, but I would, it, you can easily just go Google around and find Ellsberg articles about Chelsea Manning, Snowden, Assange, uh, Reality Winner, Daniel Hale, all the sort of whistleblowers of our own time. And without exception, he looks upon them to one degree or another, another as uh, committing acts of heroism, that, that, he, that he celebrates them and supports them and believes that they have been um, mistreated and that the Espionage Act which now maybe some of us think, oh, it'd be great if it's used against Trump. I hasten to say it's a terrible law and should either be totally abolished or vastly reformed because the language is so baggy uh, and was uh, n never, in my mind, intended to be used for domestic whistleblowers. And there's no question that if Snowden were in town, he would be in, you know, uh, living a kind of prison life not unlike maybe Assange. I mean, um, because there is no, um, uh, you're, un, you're not allowed, the way the law works, to, um, uh, to give a, na a national uh, interest uh, uh, defense, to say, I, I talk about your motives for doing something, that's for the public good. It's just, did you do this or not? Did you t convey these papers or not, these unauthorized papers? Yeah. 
I want to say, this is great, thank you. Um, I'm really glad you mentioned GI letter assistance. I'm writing my dissertation on that. And um, I'd love to talk to you more about that, especially elsewhere's view of that. But here's my question. I, I'm, a, I'm a grad student, and we think quantitatively and qualitatively. And you talked a lot about the intellectual sort of push that was, these papers have on him. What about the quantitative? Does, does he crunch the numbers as well? And, and how much of that, on top of the intellectual, pushes him towards realizing that this is a fault? That this is a what? That this is a fault, that, that the war is unknown. Uh, you know, I, I think by one of the transformations was kind of wean himself of that kind of Robert McNamara obsession with quantification. <laughs> uh, he was very much a part of that world, but um, uh, he, I wouldn't say he's completely tra transformed. I mean, he still w wants all kinds of evidence and w would, would welcome quantitative evidence for just about any subject. Uh, but he, he, he now, I think, has a much broader interest. I mean, for interest, he's very interested in oral history, which kind of surprised me, you know, because it's, you know, it's, a, it's so, you know, memory is unreliable, but he's fascinated by it. And one of the things that's not in the Pentagon Papers that he wishes were, it was disallowed kind of the, the way it was set up, no oral histories. But he looks back on it and said, God, if we had been able to interview people, that would have been so useful. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just as interested in the idea of the shift in, in opinion and we reflected it to today. It seems like we have shifted into the union. It was uh, kind of devastating coming from the other direction. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, is there, a, I think if I get it right, is there a shift in opinion today analogous to the shift that the U.S. went through in the sixth? Oh, you're saying it's an opposite shift of becoming a, a yeah. Um, well, I think it's complicated because I, I do see among students uh, who get very inspired by this history and by figures like Ellsberg, uh, a real openness to critical-minded thinking about you know, all kinds of subjects. Um, our political culture are sort of dominant, if you could say that do there is a dominant political culture, uh, I, I agree, is not what it might have been in that moment of 1969 through 71, where I think we came as close as ever in our history to really fundamentally challenging these kind of, say, you know, broad faith in American exceptionalism, a core tenet of which is that the United States has always been the greatest force for good in the world, always on the side of democracy and freedom and human rights. I, I think that was really shattered but in the decades since then, and not just in the 21st century, I think effectively from the Reagan years on, this is sort of the thrust of the argument I try to make in this book, American Reckoning. The decades since, we've kind of cobbled back together new forms of American exceptionalism, a little more brittle and defensive and even bombastic and more xenophobic too. Scary, but still very, still, still there. So a lot to contend with, this, this sort of the new nationalism. And, Anybody want to end on a, end on a happy note? <laughs> Good. All right. No, 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 no. Thanks. It's a pleasure. Yeah.